welcome wherever you are joining us from the world. We are grateful that you have chosen to join our webinar for the next hour or so as we speak about a global outlook for 2022. Joining me tonight, I've got Andrew Mobsby, Anthony Durham, Garth Wellham, Sheldon Hallcore, and Scott Pickin. But before we say hello to our panelists, I want to tell you about a partnership that we have. So we have joined up with B1G1, which is buy one, give one, which is businesses for good. What that means is that for everyone who attends our webinar, we donate education to children in need across the world. But we also understand that not everyone has the passion that we have for education. And a lot of our team members have come through and said that they are passionate about water and about um, about clean water, about uh, planting of trees and about education. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask for any engagement that you do throughout our webinar that you put a T, an E or a W behind it. And what we will do is we will donate either a tree, a day of clean water or a day of education to someone in need throughout the world. You can put any combinations of these uh, throughout the webinar. Um, it doesn't only have to be one. Obviously, the more you engage, the more letters you put in, the more that we can give on your behalf. And we really do value this input. But as I said, just straight off, everyone who has attended, we will donate one day of education to start off, including for our panelists. So now um, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, and let them uh, let you know where they are coming from. I am coming from Costa Rica. We would love for you to engage um, in the group and let us know where you are coming from on the Q&A or on the chat box. If you have any burning questions that you want our panelists to answer, can you please put them in the Q&A box? It has been activated. It just means throughout the comments, we actually know where to go to see. And some of our panelists might choose to answer them directly with you throughout the uh, presentation and not wait until the Q&A afterwards. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Scott. Welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Lee, and wonderful to be online. And uh, yeah, wonderful to have such a strong panel. And what I wanted to do just quickly before I introduce everyone is just give you a little bit of context of what Diversification 5.0 is about. We had Young Wecheling about two weeks ago talking about how the institutional markets move and basically the impact that it has on you and I as investors and how you can take advantage. Uh, today, we've effectively got um, our four authorities uh, looking at kind of the global economic uh, perspective. Then in two weeks time, we've got Mark Robertson in terms of building a portfolio. And I will also be looking at some of the reviews um, in the coming weeks. What I think is important though, is why are we doing diversification You know, 5.0? And I'm not gonna repeat what I say every week, but, you know, really, there's some major principles when it comes to making money and wealth. Don't lose money, asymmetric risk reward, tax efficiency and diversification. And if you've seen me talk, I do a lot about Ray Dalio and how he talks about these uncorrelated bets. Last uh, two weeks ago, I played these videos, um, which pretty much sum up his book principles. And this, this is the video here. Where's my thing just gone? Give me two seconds. Oh, that's interesting. My PowerPoint suddenly disappeared on me. Anyway, um, I'm not going to play this video because that's, that's very different from the passive investment market. This uh, link, I'll put the link into the chat box that you can go and watch it. But what really is important is that he says, you know, the most important thing for an individual investor is to know how to diversify well in a balanced way. The greatest mistake is to think that what was done, what is done well lately is a better investment rather than more expensive and what has done badly lately is a bad investment rather than cheap. Unless you know how to deal with the differences of those, which most people don't, they're going to be in trouble. Understand that the total amount of wealth essentially doesn't change very much. One thing goes up and one thing goes down. You need to know how to diversify in assets, countries, and currencies. Knowing how to diversify your wealth is the most important thing. Do not think that cash is a safe investment. Cash is almost always the worst investment. Think a little bit unconventionally, diversify well, be humble, don't market time, and be conscious of the dangers of cash. And with that, I wanted to introduce our panel. The first panelist is Andrew, and Andrew Mobsby uh, comes from Cashbox Global. He's worked in the financial services for over 30 years, mainly in private banks, offshore fiduciary structuring and investments. He worked in the international global investment banks, dealing with ultra high net worth individuals and families. And then in 2013, went on his own 
uh, to set up his own general counsel for a family office practice in South Africa. Andrew, just some interest. Welcome. And uh, where are you coming in from? Hi, Scott. Sorry, I was late joining. I, uh, we were supposed to have a bit of a side check earlier. Uh, Cape Town, South Africa, which is a bit wet and windy this afternoon. We've had a bit of a late summer as we slide into winter. But um, yeah, blessed to be in one of the most beautiful cities in, in, in certainly in the world, I believe. Awesome. Well, it's wonderful to have you online and yourself and Garth have done a couple of these with us and uh, have given us such insights that people ask uh, for, for you guys to keep coming back. So I um, really appreciate you being here. Pleasure. Thank you. The next uh, authority is Garth Wellman, and uh, he's the CEO and founder of Calio Capital. He's part of the management team and board of directors. Uh, he's on the investment committee. Uh, they're also a family office and they focus on asset management. And Garth, uh, same for yourself. It's wonderful to have you online. And whereabouts are you coming from in the world? Yeah, so first of all, Andrew, uh, great to see you again. I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see you again now at the end of COVID because the last time I saw you was when we were about to go into lockdown in Cape Town. So I'm also coming from the Western Cape, but down in Stanford, about 150 kilometers or so from... Uh, Cape Town and yeah, enjoying the rain that's finally arriving after a really, really hot day. So Cape Town, Western Cape, good evening, everybody, and uh, look forward to chatting. Awesome. Well, wonderful, Garth, and great to have you online. And then what uh, Garth has um, invited is uh, two of his colleagues, one being Sheldon, um, Hulk Crow, sorry, Sheldon, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, um, the executive partner based in America, and specializing in high net worths, building generational wealth. And originally, if I, if I remember from NetBank, uh, private wealth. Uh, so Sheldon, I'm not quite sure where you are. Um, I, I met you in Cape Town, but I'm not sure if you're in America already. Yeah, so uh, recently returned from a fairly extensive roadshow in the US. Um, uh, spent a lot of time in Chicago and uh, Miami, but back in Joburg for a couple of weeks uh, and then heading back to activate offices probably by the end of end of uh, August, at end of uh, July, sorry. And where are you going to be based? Uh, we're going to be based in uh, just outside Miami. Oh, cool. Nice, uh, nice weather. <laughs> yeah. Hot. Uh, and, uh, well, wonderful to have you online, Sheldon. And then Anthony Dinham. And uh, Anthony I, is an associate partner based in South Africa and specializes in wealth creation. And Anthony, from your perspective, you know, Garth was uh, mentioning about sort of the digital world and what's happening. And uh, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about uh, kind of uh, where, well, firstly, where you are and a little bit around um, just sort of your background in terms of that digital wealth. Sure. Firstly, thanks for having me, Scott. Um, like you said, I'm an associate partner at Calio. Um, I, I sit with Garth in the asset management division. Um, something that was purely traditional finance up until a few months ago. Um, and we really started to, to put our feelers out into the digital space. Uh, we had a lot of clients that were really looking to explore the space. And we just wanted to kind of facilitate um, something that was safe and secure and really guide them through that, that process. And that's really how the, the digital offering was born. Awesome. Well, look, I really appreciate uh, all four of you uh, being online. It's wonderful to get different perspectives in terms of where we're coming at. And if you don't mind, uh, for all the panelists, uh, not the panelists, sorry, all the attendees, um, what we're going to do tonight is, is kind of go with the ebbs and flows. One of the things that I love in previous ones where Andrew and Garth um, have been involved is kind of it's that philosophy of a bit of a fireside chat. So if people do have questions, please chuck them into the chat box and we'll kind of ebb and flow uh, based on where we're at. What I thought we would start with and maybe, Andrew, if we could go in the same order in terms of how we kind of just went through it. But I'd love to know what your thoughts on what's happening in the world. I mean, we live in a, a fairly crazy world at the moment. You know, we, 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 we've got Ukraine, we've got rising interest rates, we've got inflation. I heard there's 8,000 boats stuck outside Shanghai and, and not being able to move. What, what's kind of your take on, on the world at the moment? I mean, it seems the uncertainty and the craziness just, just keeps growing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've come out of two very, two very weird years um, that the world, or certainly people on this call, myself included, haven't ever experienced it. You know, the, the COVID pandemic, when it arrived on our doorstep in the beginning of 2020, 
Um, it took the world on effectively a two-year roller coaster, and the headwinds that it created are still pretty much with us in, to some degree. Maybe not on the medical front, but certainly on the economic and financial front. So, yeah, it, it was a very, it was two very strange years in terms of how culturally, how economically, financially, uh, socially, how the world had to reset, readjust uh, in terms of its behaviors, its interactions, and how, how, we, how, we, how we do business, uh, the whole global sphere. And, you know, the way we recovered um, in some of the webinars I present, I call it a, a bit of a rubber band recovery, which is a very narrow recovery led out of mainly the US tech sector. And, you know, unless you were in that sector, for example, um, a lot of people did the wrong thing. Um, they crystallized their panic into sort of fireside selling. Um, you know, literally their house was burning down, they felt sell and get out. Um, and I think that's one of the core disciplines of, of, a, of, a, of a seasoned investor or, or a seasoned advisor is to have discipline. So a lot of discipline went out the window. And I think as we've recovered, um, you know, certainly into 2022, we've seen a complete rotation out of that tech space into, you know, all those, those value situations around the world. There's very good, great, profitable companies with great management teams, leadership teams, uh, great companies with great heritage who were left behind, who've not taken the fall. But with this overheated world that we live in, um, you know, the money for free party is not, uh, the, the party for free money is now effectively over as world governments tighten the, you know, the fiscus, their fiscus, their fiscal uh, stimuli. And essentially, um, inflation is the bogeyman that we haven't had for two years. You know, all the words of normalcy, which I, I would suggest are inflation, uh, interest rates, growth constraints, um, they've suddenly come back into, into vogue, even the words like profession, uh, recession, stagflation. But we've got these, these hangovers that have come uh, with it in terms of China's had this massive spike, as you mentioned. You know, Shanghai is one of the major exporting uh, hubs in the world, world's second largest economy, probably the biggest exporter. And uh, 25 million people in the city have just gone into lockdown. Um, the... The other, the other big pall that's hanging over us is um, the, the Eastern European conflict, which has actually had got global ramifications in terms of it's touched all four points of the compass uh, globally, this, this war that's going on. And yeah, there is a, I suppose the, at the end of the day, there is this uh, dilemma that is, there's a guy with a big red button that could press, uh, could press a nuclear holocaust, which would pretty much mean that it doesn't matter where your money is, you're, you're in shook. So a lot of those have, have, have sort of toned down in the last couple of weeks, but I think the volatility is here. Um, time for cool heads, time for preservation. And certainly if one hasn't been diversified, now's the opportunity to diversify. But to come back to some, one of my mantras, discipline is absolutely key. Um, and your relationship with your advisor or your investment house, that is absolutely key to be guided and to take their counsel and you know, to build your team and have your team on your side. But yeah, Scott, I think 2022, they always said it was going to be a challenging year with interest rates and all the other bad things, the bogeymen that have visited us. And they've thrown a few extra things in there like COVID spikes and a war, et cetera. So challenging times and even more reason that an investor needs to be close to his portfolio to understand what he's actually looking for at the end of the day, the takeoffs that he's wanting and the discipline that he needs to bring um, and safeguard, you know, literally his, his wealth and hopefully his intergenerational wealth. Awesome. Oh, well, thanks very much, Andrew. Garth, from your perspective. Yeah, look, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to run through the, the three people that are here from Calia. I mean, you know, what, one of my main focuses tonight was, it, being a multifamily office, we, we deal with a hell of a lot of that emotion um, when a market is down. We deal with a lot of emotion around, you know, this time's going to be different. And, and I think what's critical, speaking on behalf of both Anthony and Sheldon, who will add, you know, individual things, is, is to really sit in a position now. And that's why I brought quite a comprehensive team um, with tonight, is for people to ask questions so that we can deal with, with those fears. But I think Andrew, in his economic 
you know, summary there has covered pretty much why we're in a mess. But, you know, if you just take what you put up by Ray Dahlia, it's a summary of what Andrew is saying there. You know, this is where the, the top advisors really earn their keep. It's not when the markets are running. You know, it, it's, it's controlling the behavioral finance that exhibits itself now. It's understanding that, you know, cash will always produce a below inflation return. So when we look at the, the economic background that we're sitting with with 2022, if you go back to the recorded webinars about two and a half years, just before we went into COVID, and during COVID, I spoke a lot about, you know, the, the mistakes that we were making and the world was making. We're going to come home to roost in two to three years time. And we're seeing a lot of that. And, you know, Andrew covered those economic things, but added to that, it wasn't just this stimulation of the markets to recover from COVID and to pick up COVID. You know, you could only do that for so long. But now with the global shortages we have, with the overvaluation of tech, the, the, the super run that some of the tech companies had as a result of COVID, um, are coming home to roost in the form of inflation. You know, throw in, throw in a Eastern European war and you've got a perfect storm. And the only thing about that perfect storm, which I'm quite surprised by, is that we're only as down as we are. I mean, what the world hasn't had is a sustained period of down. Okay, we haven't had a sustained period where investors have been tested around that. And, and the problem now, compared to the historical thing, and Andrew and, you know, Sheldon Anthony's a lot younger, but Andrew and Sheldon will know this, having been in the advisory and in the, you know, investment game between 20 and 30 years, but, you know, each one of us, you'll know that the behavior now is exasperated by the fact that people get so much noise, they get so much media, they get so many people marketing an agenda and an asset class. But that Ray Dalio statement, I think is critical because whilst the markets are changing, whilst the volatility is increasing, and I think looking forward, I think we're in for a very different landscape. We're in for very different geopolitical risks. The rules of investment will not change. The staying in and exactly what was stated in that, understanding what is cheap, understanding what is quality, understanding the rules and diversification that we're going to talk about tonight remains to me critical. But the outlook for 2022 is, is one of uncertainty. And anybody who sits here with a crystal ball and says, this is what's going to happen. I think we're going to be down for longer. And I think we've, we've got a lot of stuff that's got to come out of the woodwork and we've got a lot of geopolitical risks, but it doesn't change the fact. If you look at the indices, the Russell 2000 and any of the indices out there, it does not change the fact that we're seeing cheaper levels and time to buy and to start considering buying. Not 100% not let's go in, but really good investors now are seeing opportunity, okay? It just it's uh before I move to you, Sheldon, I just wanted to make a comment. I was talking to one investor two or three days ago, and she went from last week sort of talking about how real estate is where she wanted to be to then Rich Dad Poor Dad said real estate is a bad investment and she must look at affiliate marketing. And I think all I'm trying to point out is that noise you talk about, because it, it gets more and more confusing. I was like, how can you go from real estate to affiliate marketing? in the space of 72 hours, you know, and we're talking, we're talking proper quality cash. I, I, I'm not talking a hundred dollars yet, you know? And, um, and so I, you know, I, I just, I think it summarizes, well, no, not summarizes, epitomizes what you're talking about. There's so much noise and so many opinions. And it's interesting what you said then, Sheldon, I'd love to kind of A, take your, 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 your take on this, this question, but, but also come back to what Garth mentioned around the fundamentals, because, you know, in the 20 years, I'm not in the 30 year bracket, but the 20 year bracket I've watched in highs and lows, the fundamentals don't change. And, and you know, God mentioned the fundamentals. And I think if people can focus on the fundamentals, that's how they can move away from the noise. What, what's your take on, on kind of any, any additional things to add to kind of what Andrew and uh, God have mentioned? Okay, so maybe just a few quick points. So uh, I've worked with a couple of advisors and clients that have been in the market for 10 years. And, you know, Garth's saying we've had the best 10 years than we've had in most of our working careers. But a lot of those 
those advisors they've been involved for the past decade had never seen the market come off uh, you know so whether however we define this so you know whether it's a bear market a crash a correction any one of those um i'm i'm also a little bit surprised you know so most are saying that uh, that a lot of a lot of the factors influencing the markets have taken us by surprise but i, I challenge that i don't know that they were all a surprise you know so issues with some of our state-run enterprises and ESCOM. I mean, we've known about that for a decade. Uh, we knew that was, we knew that was, yeah, we knew they weren't going to resolve that. Um, some of the geopolitical risks, uh, I mean, Russia incursion into the Ukraine, we didn't expect it to be this severe, but surely sort of some of the writing was on the wall with, uh, with what they did in the Crimean Peninsula. Um, you know, you've got issues in Turkey and China and Iran. I mean, we've known about this for a long time. We've been talking about geopolitical risks for, for the past five or six or seven years. You know, some of the other stuff that everyone's raising as risks, so uh, global warming and the climate factors and the impact on insurance and crops. That's nothing new. We've, we've known about that. You know, the issue of rising rates, uh, a lot of the central bank and reserve bank governors have been warning about, um, you know, loose monetary policy. And at some point uh, that party would end and we would have rising rates and we should be positioning for this long in advance. Uh, not, not just as, as individual but portfolios. Um, you know, COVID took us by surprise, but I don't think anyone anticipated COVID was going to be a three-month event and the impact on supply chains, you know. So with, with respect, we've had, we've had sort of two years to position ourselves and client portfolios for all of this. Uh, I suppose the big thing that, that everyone asks now is, I mean, sort of, so, so what, do, what do we do now? Um, the truth is, I mean, I suppose the brutal answer, it's, it's, it's too late now, you know, you should have been, harvesting over the past two, three years as those valuations became expensive. We should have been taking profits. We should have been shifting to defensive industries. We should have been cutting back on equity exposure. You know, a lot of us have. I've seen not, a lot of the portfolios I look at, not everyone was. We should have been overweight cash. And, uh, you know, when the, the dollar broke 15, we should have been externalizing that cash. Now everyone's saying, well, it's, uh, you know, risk off and we're moving out of equity. I, I take the opposite view. I'm saying uh, now when we should be drip feeding funds back into the market, into oversold and attractive markets, uh, not aggressively, uh, as Garth had mentioned, but certainly when everyone's uh, rushing to move to defensive portfolios and move to cash, uh, I, I'm, I'm taking an opposite view right now. I want to look forward through the cycle over the next 18 months and, uh, and position accordingly. From your perspective, Anthony, I know, I know it's always hard when you've had three other people kind of, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, give an opinion in terms of the area, but any, any angles or thoughts that you, that you think uh, need to be brought to awareness? Yeah, I think the, the last 10 years is an interesting time period because we've seen relatively low interest rates and low inflation for a, a very sustained period of time. And, and what that's kind of led to is it's led to an, a growth sector that's done phenomenally well. Typically, your, your growth sector run higher than, than average uh, leveraged balance sheets. Um, they, have, they have revenue models that are, that are forward looking and, and therefore inflation plays a big role in those numbers. So their, their prices get inflated because there's, there's low inflation. Um, and, and that's really what we've seen. And we've seen growth companies do exceptionally well. Now, we're really starting to see a bit of a seismic shift in the market where we're not going to go back to inflation at one, two, three percent. I think those those transitory talks and and, and those times are, are behind us, and we're going to need to see, like Sheldon said, interest rates increasing, and really that's that's opening the window for these defensive and cyclical style plays, um, often overlooked for the last ten years. Um, it's interesting to note that if you if you kind of take some of the big tech companies back 10 years and you look at their weights and the indices, um, they were fairly small. Now, when you're buying the NASDAQ or the S&P 500, you're actually buying a very select bunch of companies that make up a large percentage of those indices. So I think, I think this, this shift has given, given rise to the active manager. Um, I think you need to be incredibly careful where, where you place your money at the moment. I think um, high dividend uh, global plays are, are probably going to be your best uh, bet. Some of the cyclical guys that have been often overlooked that now comprise one, two percent of indices, um, you, you're going to need to get uh, 
active managers to identify those. And I think it's, I mean, you look at some of the stats, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these big asset managers have been kind of riding the wave on these tech stocks. They, they often, I mean, as we know, they get, they get bonuses and stuff paid out based on the fund performance. So it's easy to allocate to these and just let them run. Um, I think now we're really going to see um, the, the guys that, that know what they're doing step forward um, and, and generate return in this environment. I don't think um, th there's going to be a situation where there's going to be no returns or anything like that. I do think we'll recover, but I think one needs to start being very tactical and active in your decision making. Okay. So I read something just yesterday that I thought was quite interesting. So I know James and Andrew, you guys, I'm uh, sorry, Garth and Andrew, you guys have been involved with James Painter before in different, we have done webinars and live events and he talks a lot about the currency side. And I just, I just thought I literally got this yesterday and it was like the dollar index is um, the, it's at the, it's now the strongest it's, it's been since December 02, the Euro dollar, is it within a hair's breadth of the low of Jan uh, 17. The dollar rand is at a November 2021 high. Um, the gold, so gold has plummeted in spectacular fashion, losing over 10% of its value in the past month. And then probably the one that a lot of people know about already, Bitcoin lost a whopping 40% of its value in the past month uh, since December 2020. And Luna, a recent popular corn, was top of the pops just a few weeks ago, back in April breaking to around $120 per coin and last week was decimated, crashing to 0 0.01, uh, so basically wow. one cent on some exchange. And apparently Binance's Luna Holdings went from 1.6 billion US dollars to $2,400. Um, so that, that's quite significant. And there's two different sides to that. So maybe, Andrew, maybe we'll start with you, not on the crypto side, let's start on the currency side. Why, why do you think there's been such a, this correction in currency um, and, and the strengthening of the dollar against everything else. Yeah, look, it's, uh, I actually followed the, funny enough, I followed the crypto uh, quite closely, um, especially when, you know, those, oh, those decimation please, of please values. Please drop in any insights. I, I, the question <laughs> no, yeah. those, those decimation of values were, were you know, were, were, were really behemoth. But, you know, if, we, if one looks at that particular instrument, well, that, 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 that class of instrument, uh, the blockchain crypto sort of space, um, the incremental, exponential, whatever, however you want to define it, growth. Um, you know, I suppose the mantra, what goes up quickly can come down quickly. Um, I guess, and I'm not an expert on it. I've listened to some very, very educated people uh, with a lot of great gymnastic matter between their ears. And my, my sort of take on it was it wasn't devised as a, as a currency initially. Well, it wasn't devised as a currency. It wasn't desired, devised as an asset class. But it's essentially became become that. And I think a lot of people thought that uh, crypto was going to be a safe haven type of opportunity, um, you know, even maybe even pegged to, to some sort of safety standard when you know other asset classes were, were in the bin or on the floor, that they would be shielded and protected. And I think because there's been such massive um, attribution of interest in these in this space that people also became net sellers um, and you know it just crashed out um, i'm not going to go into the where and with all in terms of what backs it or what doesn't back it it's just simply mimicked what the um what the some of the big indices are doing now you know you've got institutional investors now so when they make a big sale you know it starts mimicking what the s p or the nasdaq was as, as, as god said what the russell's doing which is a much broader sort of exposure so onto the currency space, and again, I'm, I'm not a currency watcher per se, but it's been interesting. I've always watched uh, in terms of the, the offshore space, dollar, dollar pound. It's always been a, a reasonable predictor of fairly stable first world currencies. So, you know, from a South African perspective, where I have South African families um, living in a warm climate, I always suggest keep some of your cash or the vast majority of your cash in a cold climate in the shade in a currency that is not afflicted by these, these permanent uh, you know, endemic risks we have, for example, in, in, with the RAND in South Africa. So typically, uh, US dollar and pound sterling have been, have been favorites. And they've always traded very closely together. But you know, again, there have been some 
quite extraordinary circumstances that the world has seen. We, we saw Brexit come along. What was going to happen? Would there be implosion of the EU? What would happen if they left, which they have not done? Um, you know, would other countries want to leave? Would that be the end of the euro uh, or the trading bloc or whatever? Um, and the States has obviously had a fairly tumultuous leadership um, sort of past four or five years in terms of the previous administration, in terms of some of the decisions made, both economic and, and political, uh, in terms of policy. Um, and one's had to watch, you know, obviously what's happened with the, the with COVID, the two world's biggest economies were shut down, boarded up, and, and that was it. We were told to behave differently. So there have been different stresses and strains, I certainly believe, pushing all the currencies around. What seems to be the situation, certainly in the last few months, is that the dollar has become preeminent um, in terms of its trading bias against most of its you know, first world trading uh, uh, currencies. Um, I mean, the US, yeah, let's not forget it is the world's biggest economy. Um, if one looks at, you know, when, uh, I think Sheldon's got a very valid point when he said, there's an opportunity to buy value. Garth mentioned fundamentals. It's, these are US dollar-backed companies. They're, most of their revenues are generated worldwide, but they, they, they report in US dollars. And if you look at what's been happening in the US, I mean, I think in Q, in fact, I have the figure, the actual figure here. Uh, if you just, um, ah, damn, sorry about that. I should have had it up and ready and looked really clever. But um, I think, yeah, the... 79% of S&P companies reported their earnings per share above estimates in quarter one, 2022. So that was, as we said, with a sort of a conflict going on with COVID going on and all these headwinds of inflation. So as Garth said, you know, I think we're doing quite well for all these headwinds. You know, it seems like we're still in the tailwinds of, of the recovery. Um, the PE ratios of the S&P have come down to a far better valuation. They, in the next 18 months, if inflation does fall, um, are going to be ripe opportunities uh, certainly in the States, to invest in value opportunities in quality companies with fundamentally you know, strong leadership teams, strong balance sheets that are at better valuations, better entry pricing points. Um, so I certainly feel at the moment your diversification, if a client says to me uh, or a family says to me, what currencies do we pick and choose? That often depends on the the nature of the family's dynamics. Have they got debt in a particular currency? Have they got servicing issues? Uh, is there financing? Is there leverage? What are the safety margins? We need to look at all those, uh, you know, obviously you need to pay in the right currencies. Um, and the FX, you know, trades that go on sometimes, well, certainly I, I believe in some of the South African banks is they like robbery, what they charge consumers. Um, and, uh, yeah, I certainly believe, again, a diverse, diversification of currencies and not just keeping everything, for example, in US dollars simply because it's the flavor. Um, there's opportunities to buy in at, at a discount as well. Well, what is your take on <clears throat> the, the whole thing around currency? Because, yeah, I mean, you've got diversification. I think Andrew just said it, you know, Ray Dalio says diversify across countries, currencies and assets. So what, what's your kind of take on the currency component? No, it's, uh, you know, for me, it's very simple. I mean, you know, gold was a traditional hedge. It pushed up to the $2,000 an ounce mark. It comes off 10%. You know, it, it's a hedge. It's there. Um, you know, no, Bitcoin and cryptos are not a currency. They, for me, a tech digital asset class, and they're not a currency. Like Andrew, a lot of people, what, what Andrew said there's very important. A lot of people thought this would become the modern hedge that when, you know, Things were on blood was on the street. People would plow into the crypto as a as a digital hedge. It didn't turn out to be that. It turned out to be another volatile asset class within what I construe to be an equity, you know, an, an equity holding. So, so just to talk about simple fundamentals and you know try and keep it fireside and not too technical. Whenever the world's in trouble, okay, the dollar is the safe haven currency. It's because it's 70% uh, of the world's, you know, economy. And, you know, it, it's united as the underlying currency in the investment world. It doesn't mean you shouldn't diversify into the other currencies, but it, it's where money goes when people are panicked. And, you know, throw in some, uh, 
you know, volatility across uh, the European space. And it's, it's, it's a stronger case for the dollar. So it's always going to be, well, not always going to be, let me correct that. But in the current economic fundamentals, the dollar will be where people go when, when they're fearful. Keep it simple. From, um, from your perspective, Anthony, and again, I'm going to ask just on the digital space. Um, and I, don't think too much time, but I, I don't know if you are up to speed with what's happened with this whole um, sort of decimation of Luna, and et cetera, kind of Bitcoin. Have you got any thoughts around that specifically? I, I didn't, we didn't come here to have a crypto conversation, but it's actually interesting because anyone that talks diversification, someone, you know, almost everyone's going, oh, no, I've got my crypto portfolio there now. Yeah, and I think it's really kind of earned its way into, into the conversation as, as, a, as a diversifying tool. So I think firstly, on, on Bitcoin kind of coming off 40% this year, I think first and foremost, it, it is a risk asset. Um, like Art was saying, you, you need to view it as a risk asset. Um, when, when, when things happen in the world, risk assets generally come off. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take it out of that grouping. Um, I think in my mind, if something's gone up 9,000%, um, a little 40% drop is, is not, not the end of the world. It's, it's a space you're playing in. Um, you need to expect volatility in that space purely because we're so early to market. Um, I was looking at some interesting charts. And really, if you, if you kind of draw some con conclusions to the kind of tech era and the internet era, we're pretty much in 1995. Um, and things really kind of kicked off in the 2000s. So we are early to market. Um, you need to expect the volatility to, uh, in, the, in the space. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really the price to pay. Um, in terms of the Luna, the whole Luna debacle, um, funnily enough, it's actually delisted off Binance. You can't even, can't even get it anymore. It's completely gone. Um, but really what happened there was, was, was Luna has a stable coin, which is a, 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 crypto cover, uh, a cryptocurrency equivalent of a dollar. So it's pegged one to one to the US dollar. Now, th th there's two ways with stable coins how you can achieve that peg to the dollar. The first one is via an algorithmic stable coin, and the other one is via a privately backed stable coin. Um, Luna was an algorithmic stable coin. And there was, there was some sustained pressure on the downside, which caused it to lose its peg. And I mean, obviously, that's really kind of bad news for a, for a stable coin. You, your whole, the whole function of a stable coin is to be stable. So, so losing that peg resulted in severe market panic. Um, and guys just started offloading their holdings like there was no tomorrow. Um, and they couldn't recover that peg. Um, so yeah, luckily in our in our crypto portfolios, both local and offshore, we managed to to avoid that holding. Um, so we so we came out of that one fairly unscathed. <clears throat> well, then you've been looking at families, you know, for a long time, uh, wealthy families, and we've spoken quite a lot about fundamentals. Could you kind of highlight to us three, four sort of fundamentals that they use? To not only create wealth but also to preserve wealth. Like, what would you, what would you say if, if you were to try and draw some parallels or patterns or trends? What do you see as consistently over the years? And I don't mean in up markets or down markets. I just mean consistently. Okay. Um, you know, so I suppose there's 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 always the sense the sort of everyone else looking at high net worth families that sort of make the publications and the, the top 100 lists and everything else that they've got some magic secret source uh, that the rest of us don't know about it. But the truth is having engaged with these families for the past two decades, I would suggest, I would suggest there's probably four things that, uh, that, are, that are common and practical strategies that they follow. So the first, uh, with, uh, without a doubt, is the structuring element. So the structuring element, you know, before they rush headlong into markets and asset classes and jurisdictions, it's building the foundation. You know, if, you, if you've built the house on, on, on unstable foundations, uh, you've got an issue. So the structuring. So what does structuring mean? Structuring means you're making use of instruments and uh, the vehicles like wills and trusts and special purpose vehicles and using joint accounts between you and your spouse. Uh, you know, why are you doing that? Uh, you're doing that mostly to minimize the tax burden 
and ultimately ensure some sort of generational planning and the ability to leave a legacy. So that's the first. Uh, the second is the, what keeps coming up in, in these conversations is diversification. And it's not just diversification into different currencies and different asset classes, but different countries as well. You know, so some of the developed markets arguably provide a more predictable, stable stream of risk-adjusted returns. Um, going international gives you access to a handful of industries that aren't readily available in South Africa. Uh, going international with that diversification provides the, the hedge for currency depreciation. Um, and you know, going international, you know, we've had a very favorable window of opportunities. Not only have the markets been trading at a fairly significant discount, but you've had sort of the currency recently back at 15. I mean, there was no better opportunity. So the first I mentioned was structuring. The second I mentioned was international diversification. Um, what a lot of those families have taken that international diversification one further and actually use that to create uh, uh, what we call a plan B, you know, um, that involves alternative residency, residency programs. So, uh, you know, obtaining a, a, a visa by investment, you know, whether that's into the US via the EB-5 program or the Portuguese golden visa. Not only are you diversifying your investments internationally, but that investment actually becomes your passport uh, to international uh, inter international options. And then I suppose the last of all of those is their portfolio construction. And a lot of the portfolio construction, you know, it's, it's difficult to decide. Difficult to decide, do you buy into uh, the differences at um, Toyota or BMW? Who knows? But what these families are recognizing are what I would call some of the mega trends. You know, so mega trends. you know, the, the, what we are fairly certain of was what's going to win over in the next couple of years are things like electric vehicles and ride sharing and autonomous vehicles. So whoever's leading the charge in those areas, that's where you want to be. You know, that's not a short term theme. That's not going to play out between now and August. That's what's going to pay you dividends and returns and grow your wealth uh, over the next decade. So I would, I would argue those four separate things um, uh, in international diversification, structuring, um, possibly the plan B and careful portfolio construction. Buying into the mega trends. Uh, that's, that's excellent. Andrew, from your perspective, the future of the world economy, you know, we've spoken quite a lot about where we are and we've kind of spoken about what to be aware of. But if I'm a person listening to this webinar, you know, where are the opportunities to be found now? What, what should I be looking at? We've spoken quite a lot about the risks. We've spoken about some of the defensive markets, et cetera, but you know, what, what would you say is a place that, that people could be looking at for opportunity? You know? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, yeah. I've, I've worked with Sheldon over the years for a few years, and uh, I think we sing from the same hymn sheet in, in, in many respects. So I think he's already alluded to, you know, the world has changed. Um, I mentioned that the, the you know, last two years, the last two years have been very weird. And out of that, um, you know, the future that we all spoke about in many respects we're living in, uh, what were disruptive industries on our mainstream, they're part of our DNA, we take them for granted. We were on Zoom tonight. Ten years ago, nobody heard of it. Uh, everybody was on Skype. So I think it's the case of, of those mega... God, there's of a those word mega, we haven't heard, eh? <laughs> <Skype>. <laughs> or dial-up internet, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very much a case um, of these mega trends. You know, so much commentary, there's so much noise about Where's the next big thing coming from? You know, is it going to be flying taxis? Is it going to be lithium? Uh, everybody's talking about lithium being the, you know, the new white gold and Nevada being the, the Nirvana. <laughs> the Nirvana will be the Nirvana of, of the savior of the, of the batteries and, and what have you. So there are so many new, um, the development of themes, I think is very, very important. So diversification across a portfolio is one thing, and you can break it down into sectors. So whether it's cyclical or defensive, um, or it's consumer staples, et cetera, et cetera. You can then break it down further into where are those mega trends coming from? What is going to be, who's going to be the apple that's sitting in a garage at the moment at $1 that's going to be at current valuations in five years time, what would happen to Apple? Where's the next Google? Is it going to be in the tech space? Is it going to be in the lithium ion battery or Lithium space, is it going to be um, ride sharing? Um, you know, everybody's talking about this, this Tesla SAV, uh, you know, the, the autonomous vehicle sharing programs. Um, 
what is going to be the next major disruptor? You know, we were all talking about disruptive industries that have now become mainstream. Where's the next surge coming from? So I think thematically, you know, you can't think too far ahead. Uh, but certainly, you know, the rotation from tech from, let's say, the end of 2020 into 2021, we saw a lot of companies that had were severely undervalued in terms of their fundamentals, but they had great balance sheets, they had good leadership teams, they had a good vision, but they were chronically punished because they weren't part of that tech rubber band recovery space. So, for example, um, banks were a great place to get into probably six to eight months ago, even now. Um, you know, banks recovering, if you think about it, the logic is that interest rates are rising and the profit margins on the net interest profits that banks are going to make when people are paying higher, you know, higher service or higher servicing for debt. Banks generally do well in this area. Um, banks are generally cyclical, you know, they're, they're defensive uh, structures, entities. Um, they mirror both sides of the equation in terms of what the macro economy is looking like and also the man in the street is, you know, he's battling, he's uh, trying to put, is it energy, was it food on the table? Um, I mean, we, we mentioned electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, I certainly believe, is, is a brand new battlefield. Everybody's switching to it, but it's not a short play, it's a long thematic play. So these are the type of um, themes that I should you should build into the diversified portfolio. It's not a quick, let's jump in here because it all sounds great. Um, it's generally a thematic approach in terms of your portfolio construction. Absolutely. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the whole world at the moment is battling in terms of affordability. It's, it's highly evident what it looks like in the UK if I watch Sky TV and interpret it. You've got pensioners who are sitting there saying, do I spend money on energy or do I spend it on, on heating or do I spend it on eating? That's how, that's how critical it's becoming. It's becoming a binary, very, it's not granular. This is a binary, it's A or B. Which one do you do? Simply the affordability. So, you know, one would think staple consumer goods that you, you still got to eat. You know, will great big companies like the Unilevers, like the Walmarts, like the Kroger's do very well? Well, coming out of the States today, all the staple consumer companies are getting absolutely slaughtered because people are going and buying no name brand foods. They're not buying Heinz Craft mayonnaise, they're going to buy store mayonnaise. So there's always a, there's different angles to it, but one has to think logically, one has to think simple. I mean, I echo God's words when he says, let's keep it simple. Let's not overcomplicate matters. What makes sense to preserve, make wealth and then preserve it at the same time? Because those are the two buckets that I, I kind of look at in terms of there's a bucket that's making wealth and then there's the preservation bucket. The two have to complement each other to a degree. So lots of opportunity. Um, I, I echo what Sheldon said right at the beginning. I think there are great, great opportunities uh, to buy fantastic companies at great, at, at better valuations, pre-COVID valuations, which are probably a better, a, a better level of, of respectability, I believe. Um, but it's not a timing the market; it's spending time in the market, being disciplined, and sticking to your investment strategy for the particular takeout that you, you that you that you're strategizing for. Yeah, I want, oh, I want to add to that conversation. Yeah, Can I add to that conversation? Yeah, please do. Sure. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> the thing. It's, it's investing is deemed and always kind of viewed as this really, really like complex game. But the more logic you apply to investing, the easier it is to actually get an outcome. So before you get to what to invest in, you know, I think what people miss at this point is, has your investment plan changed because there's now a downturn? And I, th I think that's where people go wrong. They think something has to change. Well, you know what? If you started off and you just didn't like volatility and you had a balanced portfolio, that investment plan doesn't change because your emotions are different. And, and when we talk about these things and the respective space they have in a portfolio, and we talk about the opportunities. It's a game to understand these opportunities. Where do they fit into your investment plan? And, and this is critical because where I think a lot of guys are going to come unstuck is that the world of extraordinary returns, and the, this, this is just heeding a warning because I think that the world of extraordinary returns is going to be skewed in, in that when you look at your investment plan, what has not changed is the fact that 
the American market delivers a 6.9%, not a 7, a 6.9% real return after inflation. That real return, just round it off to 7. You, you must understand that inflation has been so low. So people's investment plans have looked incredibly healthy. But the fundamentals of investing remain that you have to beat inflation if you are preserving wealth. And, and this is where the responsibility of taking outside advice is so important and where the family offices that Andrew has, that the, you know, these complex teams that we build around advice are most important because all advice comes down to quite simple things. So when we talk about opportunities, please understand what percentage of your portfolio first is looking for these opportunities? You know, is it 40%? Is it 50%? Is it 60%? So before you look for the opportunities, please understand that opportunities right now is what we're talking about. You should be overweight now with your cash looking for opportunities. But to realize those opportunities, Bitcoin and these fast moving assets that have delivered quick returns and markets that have gone down 35%, you know, on the 23rd of March from COVID and in six weeks are at all time highs have skewed people's perceptions. So what people need to revert back to is an equity cycle. An opportunity cycle is as long as seven years. We run private equity because the, the opportunities we see, okay, are not always easy to find in the list of market space or to do the work. So we stay very close to these. But once you've defined what, money you have to look for those opportunities and you've worked through your financial planner, your family office, who were ever to derive that. In that opportunity space, when we look at these super trends we're talking about and to bring it back to fireside conversation, it, it's actually logic. The, the first one we have is anxious societies, which Andrew's talking about. You know, people are worried about in, a, a affordability. You've got tech replacing them. They're worried about employment. And most importantly, we're also living in a world, 198 mass shootings in America last year. So things like personal security, that's logic. We know what people are looking for. And entrepreneurs look at that and they say, how can I provide a solution? So you've got anxious societies, number one. That's an opportunity. Talking about affordability, employment, personal security. Infrastructure, what's going to provide and what, what infrastructure is needed? Transport, energy and water, smart cities. Telecom infrastructure, you know, these, that's point number two. So you've got anxious societies, you've got infrastructure. Technology, as much as we think technology was overvalued, let's understand digitalization of the world has not stopped. Virtual reality, you know, more interactive Zoom. Look how we went from Skype to Zoom. The, the more interactive where we're having 3D experiences in communication, where we're having entertainment in a more you know, in a more satisfying way, which, which goes to the next one, which is the, the millennials value, which is driving the, the digital natives, fun, health and leisure, the green attitude. You know, these are all logical things that the world is striving to provide solutions to. And that are things that we're looking for. The silver economy, if COVID did one thing, it highlighted the health risks that we have in the aging population. So you know, we're investing in private equity in mental health, in solutions to mental health, research into psilocybin, which has got massive, you know, treatments in, in, in things like depression and anxiety. So th that silver economy, you know, health and life insurance, uh, senior consumer choices, what choices are they making? And then the last one, which is very important to us at Kaleo, um, is the world that we're trying to preserve and capitalizing on climate change, electrical efficiencies. Ford can change to electrical cars. It doesn't make Ford a new company. It just changes what Ford Motor Corporation General Motors is doing. Green energy transition, sustainable transport, okay, agriculture and food. These are all logical things that the consumer market's going to need. So that's why I say, you know, one of the fireside questions here was. What are the opportunities? I think if people understand, and we, we don't have to go through them again, but there are six real dominant themes in the super trends that we're supporting both in private equity and in markets. But I, I just wanted to add to that because it seems like you need to be a guru. But a lot of this stuff in those six things are logical areas to invest in. And a lot of those are already going to be areas where existing companies 
and companies with great value are already investing in. Disney, right now, take that. Great, great time to buy it, moving into this digital entertainment. So, so not to get too hyped up about this, but I just, I just want to add some, you know, like real content around those, those six areas of super trends. Just quickly, Sorry, on your six areas, so I'm going to be the, the dummy here who takes notes and I'm asking my lecturer, but you said six and I got eight, okay? So where have I made a mistake? No, 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 I was talking societies. about, I was talking about a couple of the, uh, you know, the areas within, um, okay. you know, within but if those I, if six I'm areas. Quickly, God, I've got anxious societies, I've got personal security. Or is that now, personal security society? is inside anxious societies. Right. So anxious okay. societies right. are looking to personal security and, okay. you know, cyber security. Um, we all know the risk of that. Yeah. Technology. Okay. I think, I think you've answered them. So number two would be infrastructure. Number three would be tech and digitization and then interactive VA is part of that. Number three would be millennials and the whole digital natives, fun health. Number four would be the green kind of climate change investing and number four. Five or six, I'm getting my numbers wrong now, but would be the mental health aging space. No, so the silver economy is is the the move to healthcare and the future of healthcare and the, the longevity of people. So that silver economy is really silver is silver standing for silver hair, like just to be clear. No, no, silver economy is really it's it's off the back of the the mercury play in a thermometer. So it's known as that outside of the. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the mm. health uh, industry. Yeah. Okay. So those are the six, but yeah, I can put those six out after this, if you want to talk about the super trends, but if, if any person here on this webinar sits down and looks at that and you go, gee, you know, digital security. I mean, there is a no brainer for us. Any of these things, you know, mental health. I mean, COVID has sent the teenage population into the biggest pandemic we're ever going to have. So, so these are the things that to me are logical areas of opportunity and what companies are moving into those super trends. But the important thing there, which Andrew alluded to, these are, these are not going to be Bitcoin that's up 140% next year. These are five to seven year plays and often really getting close to the action in, you know, through private equity and the understanding of it. And the reason I know these are all working and they're logical is because of the, the tech company, the VC company we run. All the ones are shooting the lights out are one of those six. Eh? And all six of those areas we've got covered inside there. So it's logical to see that it's playing out in the, in the economy. And right now, all we're sitting with is opportunity. Adversity creates the opportunity. It builds the fundamentals again for us to, to go back to the drawing board. So yeah, I think it's a great time. Exciting. But yeah, be careful. We've got very used to very high returns and very quick recoveries. Well, then, in terms note, of, I'll mute myself. I appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else is enjoying uh, all of you and all your guys' insights. It's, uh, it's very useful. So then you, um, well, one comment there. What I like about digitization is I can take advantage of all the things you spoke about and, and invest in them. And, you know, previously it wasn't possible for the guy with $1,000 or $10,000 or even arguably $100,000 and now they can, you know, using technology, which is fantastic. So talk to us a little bit about diversification. You know, we've spoken a lot tonight about diversification and kind of this whole balancing of investment portfolio. We've kind of, we've kind of touched on it already. You've already mentioned it as one of those kind of uh, top four trends that um, you've seen the wealthy people. But is there anything that you feel tonight that we've missed out on? So I don't need to repeat what we've spoken about. But when someone's thinking diversification, and you've spoken about international, you've spoken about a plan B, but just in the essence of, of kind of diversification, because I mean, we've just, and Glass has mentioned BC, he's just talked about private equity. How does someone choose, like, you know, how many assets he should be looking at and, you know, da, da, da. Like, do you have any, any basis for that? Or, I mean, I know it's a very open-ended question, but. Yeah, so, so let me tell you, let me tell you my logic for this whole thing. So the reason anyone, talks and tells you that you need to be diversified is that what they what they alluding to is that uh, they're assuming that diversification minimizes risk okay so first point um so i mean the, the extreme example you don't want to have a single horse in the race uh, you know if your only if your only 
investment over the past year was Netflix. So that was a pretty risky bet. You shot the lights out and then you pretty much lost 80% of all your wealth. So the theory goes that rather than holding a single investment, you spread your investment. So let's assume you, you didn't just hold Netflix, you hold four or five different investments. So you've got Google, Netflix, Amazon, Zoom. Uh, well, is that diversified? Well, yeah, you suddenly you've got more stocks, but they're all in the same sector. You've taken a beating with all of those. So the logic dictates that you need to diversify and probably consider different industries, you know, financials, industrials, commodities. But that didn't do terribly well when the entire market just corrected and gave up 20%. You know, so, so maybe you shouldn't only be invested in stocks. So I'm pretty sure everyone on this call has heard the, the saying that a rising tide lifts all ships. But that rising tide also drops all ships. My view on this is replace the tide with the market. So the tide is the market. Now, sentiment drives the tide. Right now, sentiment has, the tide's gone out and that's a sentiment driven thing. But what's important over here is distinguish between the market and the economy. They're very different. So the market is the platform that we all use to buy and sell. The Just lost it. I, th I think load shedding got him, Anthony. Will you carry on from him? I'm just... Uh... When you were talking about the difference between distinguishing between the market and the economy. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll try to pick up on where he was going. Um, but I think essentially what he's saying is that when, when a rising tide lifts all ships, um, it, it really just kind of pushes the equity market up with it. And, and everyone's a benefactor of that, um, given the fact that we see like I said, I mean, just going back to the passive conversation and, and ETFs, so you, you see a ton of money pouring into the S&P 500 that naturally benefits all the companies that go with it, um, along with all the other indices. So I think now we're, we're getting into an environment where one needs to be careful. They need to understand what they're kind of buying when they're buying an index um, and just be cognizant of the fact that a lot of these, these companies that have run very hard are now making up massive weightings in that index. Um, and yeah, just a, just a word of caution around that. So I'm conscious of time here and we're sort of on the hour. And what, what I'd like to do is I've got sort of two closing questions that I want to kind of bring together and, and I kind of want to uh, put them to, to uh, the three of you. So the first question is why is now not the time to panic but to learn so that you can take advantage? And to some extent, we've actually already answered this. A couple of you have already said emotions are a bad thing. Get good advisors. Don't panic, you know, et cetera. So I don't want to kind of beat the same horse. We've kind of already been there. Um, but it sort of ties in with the second one, which, you know, I've learned in the 20-something years I've been investing and in helping people invest. But it really comes down to only two things if you want to manage risk. And that's um, getting the right information and, and having the right partners. And I wanted to kind of ask, you know, the three of you as kind of closing thoughts, you know, all of us are sitting here, it's May 2022, there's lots of things happening. You know, the webinar tonight is not advice, you know, I probably should have said that up front. So it's just just opinions in terms of where we're at. But, you know, information is vital. And, and you know, what are the, how do people get the right information? We spoke tonight about so much noise, you know, how do they get the right information? You know, and what are the things that they should be looking at for success. And again, we, we, we've been through a number of them, so we don't have to repeat them. But I'd like to kind of end off with kind of a, a closing thoughts for you guys around, you know, if, you, if you've kind of got the elevator pitch uh, to your kind of wealthy clients, but equally the advice that everyone else on this call can copy, because the whole idea is to allow the 99% to go to invest like the top 1%. What, what would you say? I mean, there's so much information out there, but how do you get good information and, and how do you make the right decisions? Shall I kick off, Scott? Um, yes, funnily yes. enough, I was, I was reading a quote yesterday um, by the US billionaire philanthropist 
uh, industrialist, not one of the new guys who uh, make his wealth look silly, but a guy from a few, quite a few decades ago, William van, der, William van der Bilt. And he said something along the lines, I might be misquoting him, but he said, any fool can actually make a fortune. But it takes, on, uh, he's a bit uh, sexist, but it takes a man with brains to hold on to it. Um, and that was his quote. So that sort of encapsulates some of the, some of the key words that you put into your, your, your throughout question in terms of, is it information? Is it a team that he's looking for? Is it advice that he's looking for? Is it help he's looking for? And I think that, that encapsulates everything. There is so much noise. Um, I like what, what Garth's approach is when talking to any investor, irrespective of wealth, is going to the end game and saying, what are you actually looking to achieve in X number of years? Um, we're not a zero to hero um, you know, environment. Those, that, those days have gone. I think we have been skewed. But what are you ultimately looking for, for you, your family, your legacy, for your moral compass? Whatever is important to you, understand those but buttons and work backwards, as opposed to we're sitting with this massive pot of cash. Let's get into all these great opportunities that are there. I think once we understand the, the DNA of the investor, this is what the investor needs to realize, you need to build your team. There's no one institution. There's no one individual that can certainly say, I can do everything better than anybody else. It's reaching out and leveraging the relationships, leveraging the information to bring it back so it makes sense in your space. Um, otherwise, you do get lost. You will get buried and you'll eventually go like, well, I need a quick fix to my solution. I'm going to take on more risk. I'll take the risk reward matrix. I'll throw it out the window. I'm, I'm happy to let that burn. But this, that shouldn't be the case. It really shouldn't be the case. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, like any entrepreneur, they can make exponential money far better than a lawyer, a doctor, a surgeon. They will make money faster, but they also might lose it faster. So it's the same risk. You don't have to take on enormous risk to get a decent, sustained, reliable, long-term reward. Brilliant. God, from your side? Yeah. You know, Scott... <sighs> We are supplied with a lot of information, but the logic and the information that one should be reading, like Ray Dalio and, you know, I mean, you know, Warren Buffett, for example, is now really becoming considered, you know, antique. But the mantras that you put into your investment plan, things like be fearful, okay, be fearful when the market is greedy. It plays out every time. When Bitcoin was flying and the market was greedy, people were leveraging themselves. So you're seeing forced sales, which pushes the things. So, so those mantras, all I'm saying is listen to the age old logic in investment. Okay. Get your information, not from sales websites, get your information from books, get your information from people that have done it. For example, a motivational speaker talking about wealth made his wealth from motivational speaking, not from investing. So read books from investors who have made hundreds of millions. I promise you they've got something to teach you. Don't listen to the Fost and the Furious. Stick to very simple principles. Sell when the markets are greedy. Buy when the markets are fearful. Okay. Buy and diversify. Okay. Very simple stuff. I don't want to repeat it, but Get your information from people who have done it, who have been there. Check your financial advisor's own acumen in terms of his bank account and his investment strategy. You know, and, and understand that nobody has more control over your money than you. But write down your mantras and do not deviate them, deviate from them. Get your mantras from investment experts that have done it, that have written the books. You know, we, we've spoken about books before, but yeah, that's just that's just my closing thing. This is the time to read about how to take opportunities. Love that. So now I'll give you a little bit of time to think. I mean, I'll start with Anthony. We're just asking for closing comments uh, in the fact that there's a lot of noise out there. Where do you get your information and kind of what do you do next? Let's go to um, Anthony and we'll come back to Sheldon because he didn't have a question. I think, I think Garth and Andrew have summed it, summed it up really, really well there. Um, I think if we were to get a, a bit more granular on an, on an asset management level, I think it's extremely important to partner with research providers um, that are giving you good, solid and accurate research. I think there's 
a lot of noise. There's a lot of fear mongering that we see in the media. And when you kind of get down to the actual hardcore numbers of it and you really understand, um, you, you can start to get a much better understanding of the market and where you are. Brilliant. Thank you. Sheldon, closing comments. Closing comments and apologies. I just, want to, I just want to point out that Anthony really wants to thank you for dropping an absolute perler on the difference <laughs> between the market and the economy and then dying and, and, and not quite happy <laughs> handing it to him. But none of us quite know where your train of thought was going. You know? So if you want to finish that, I appreciate that. Scott, I was I'm busy so sending the, the six uh, the, the six mega trends to uh, Lee at the time, so I wasn't really listening to Sheldon. So I had to toss a hospital pass there to Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that me. was that was that was Joburg load shedding. So, okay, let me let me let me try and sum it up with this, and it's probably uh, sort of trying to close up what everyone has said. So, rather than trying to speculate and bet on what the next winner is going to be, you sort of need to agree on sort of what we keep calling these mega trends. Uh, Garth spoke about two. Uh, so let's say demographics, changing demographics. So I think worldwide, we've got a barbell effect. On the one side, you've got millennials coming in. And I'll get to the point of this, but you've got the millennials coming in with their full spending power now. What's interesting for them, they're into ESG, environmental social governance. They're into healthy food choices. They're vegans. They're focusing on the environment. Go for the sectors and the industries where the spending power is. On the other side of the barbell, we've got aging populations. You know, So everything from Medicare to medical aid to senior housing, consider some of that. We all agree that climate change is very real. And with that comes all the themes for clean energy and electric vehicles. Right now, you need to be considering defensive portfolios and defensive stocks. So what does that mean? You know, If things are going to get bad, uh, you know, the things that I, as an individual, my kids are going to stay at school and I'm going to pay their school fees. So schools and private schools, I'm going to keep paying, paying the medical aid. If someone in my family gets hurt or ill, I don't phone around pricing doctors. I get them to the best doctors and basic retailers. I'm going to be continue buying from basic retailers, the bread and the milk and the eggs. What we also all agree, we're into a rising rate environment. So a rising rate environment Two stocks that'll do well in a rising rate environment. And it's those companies with low bearing, it's your banks, and it's the companies that can pass on the, 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 the increases. And then some of the sectors, but this is probably sort of, you know, this is, this is on the volatile side, given the significant sell-off that we've seen in tech, the types of things that I'm watching over the next decade, um, cloud computing, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, green energy, gaming, uh, virtual reality, streaming television, e-commerce, um, fintech, and then autonomous and electric vehicles. I mean, I'm not saying it's time to get into some of those right now, but I pretty much bet my career that those are the themes that we're going to be talking about for the next decade. Oh, what a wonderful way to finish off with a platform that is a fintech platform <laughs> talking about <laughs> diversification. So, uh, Thank you. I'll send you a hundred bucks after it. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> uh, but uh, no, God, I, I appreciate you sending Lee the, um, <clears throat> the different six mega trends. Uh, what we are going to do is summarize for our wealth hacker community. Uh, we're actually going to summarize um, the best takeouts from tonight and, and almost have crib notes. So if any of you uh, were at university, most of you will know that uh, the crib notes are generally the most valuable, which are kind of the key takeaways from what have we had uh, 75 minutes of, of knowledge sharing. So just really want to appreciate and say thank you to all of you. Um, God, I see that you've put uh, some answered some questions there in terms of um, Kulani's uh, question. So thanks very much for that. Um, you said read up on silver economies and how COVID has highlighted this future pandemic trend in the next two decades and the provision uh, for that. If you don't mind, I just want to share very quickly uh, my screen. And I just, uh, for, for those of you that are sitting slightly overwhelmed in terms of what to do next, you know, we basically um, built a wealth starter pack and uh, people can literally get going now. They can start from $100. They can actually invest in, you know, three, you know, three, four, five, even up to 10 uh, different investments because effectively it's, you know, our minimum investment now is, is $10. You've got the confidence of working with the team. There's an entire investor roadmap where we've got monthly online workshops to take you through it. So we've spoken a lot tonight about community and, and getting support. 
and ultimately getting to results. Our next investor roadmap is actually coming up on the 24th of May, where we can literally take people through the journey. So we'll take them through the fundamentals of what the six investors need, how to create a wealth plan, which is funny enough what Andrew, I think you said about what is the why of why you're doing this, you know, ultimately what investment categories are, what is partners and due diligence, how do you manage risk and compliance, setting yourself up on the platform, ultimately how the platform works, investing and ultimately earning a return. So if you're interested, you can literally go to wealthstarterpack.com and uh, we'll take you through that entire journey. For those of you that want to invest on the platform and just get going, you can literally go on the platform wealthmigrate.com. You can invest in real estate, structured notes, convertible debt. Uh, there's a quarterly basket. We have in the past had uh, joint, um, not joint, uh, we've had, um, uh, I've forgotten bloody what it's called, venture capital, private equity. We've got green energy coming. So a lot of the uh, different asset classes we've spoken of tonight where people can actually participate and you can actually talk with a wealth consultant. And for a few of you that are interested, and if you have been listening tonight about FinTech and some of these major trends, we've also taken our business and we've put it in two halves. We've got a B2B half, which is, uh, uh, sorry, a B2C half first, which is our community, our education and our investment. And ultimately there's an entire model around how we work with B2C. And then there's our B2B. And as a business, we are always looking for the right partners to grow. We call it our growth strategy. We've got three major growth vehicles through distribution, profitability, and technology. And if you want to reach out uh, to us, we can actually talk that through with you. There's three reasons why people become shareholders. Uh, we call them wealth partners in our group. The first is that they invest for profit. The second is that they want to be part of a global like-minded community. And the third is they want to be part of a profitable and purposeful endeavor. And just to show you the journey that we're going on at the moment, many of the people that are on this call as authorities, we've worked hard with while we've been going through this phase. We've now built out the tech, the compliance, the regulation, uh, truly to be able to scale. And we're in, we're in this part. Oh, why does it do that? So irritating. We're in this part of the journey now in terms of the process. And the purpose of tonight is not to go into the detail, but if you do want to speak to any of us, it is one of these mega trends we're talking about, then please speak with us. And so in conclusion, these are the next steps. You can literally go for the starter pack. You can go directly to the platform. You can literally start your diversification globally and become a global citizen. If you want to reach out to Lee, um, you know, either to talk about any of the things we've discussed or for the wealth partner shareholder conversation, then please do. And Lee, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna leave um, my, my screen sharing, if you don't mind, if you wouldn't mind putting up the poll. And I just wanna see if there's any questions uh, from any of the attendees before we uh, call it an evening. Let me see, I can see there's a couple of questions coming through and I'll answer that in the meantime. There's a lot of compliments. Thank you, thank you. This is great, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. So lots of uh, compliments. If there's any uh, questions uh, coming up, um, you know, put them through. We'll, we'll finish off with this, uh, with this survey. Why do we do a survey? The bottom line of why we do a survey is that we want to make sure that people, and I see no one's participating. Is there something wrong? Very unusual that naught out of 35, 30 people have participated. Lee, is it working on your side? Yeah, we do oh, have are. some that are coming through. We do have some... Okay. Um, Answers that are coming. So yeah, please participate. You know, our whole, our whole perspective is that we want to add as much value as possible. And it's always about knowing what it is that you're looking for so that we can make it a more personalized uh, service for yourself. I think from my side, you know, I just want to go back and highlight some of the notes that I took down tonight. There are a lot, but I just want to come through some of the ones that I highlighted, which I think are very, very important. So we've been through a very couple of, um, a weird couple of years. I like what you said about the rubber band and, and the U.S. tech sector. We've spoken about, you know, making sure you've got the discipline of advisor and looking at, you know, that the whole party for free money is effectively coming uh, to an end. You spoke about um, Ray Dalio's uh, statement actually being critical. Um, we spoke about the perfect storm and the, the fact that it wasn't as down as, as, uh, as it could be, basically. And then we need to really look at our behaviors and how we behave in these times. 
We also need to understand that some of these things are not surprises, geopolitical, parastate failure, global warming, and rising interest rates. Yes, COVID took us by a surprise, but now it's how do we actually deal with it? And that it's too late necessarily to be, to be acting on what worked six, 12 months ago um, in terms of you know, harvesting, selling high, et cetera. I think one of the things that I found interesting, what Anthony said, is that the high dividend uh, global plays, you know, so you want to be looking globally and, and looking at income in terms of the returns. And then if I look through you know, on the currencies, I think we explained uh, that a lot. I liked what you shared here with 79% of the S&P's earnings are actually above uh, 2021 and the PE ratios are becoming far better with regards to inflation. And then we also um, spoke about diversification and not just being in dollars. I'm not going to go into the crypto side because I think we can pretty much jump through that. Um, I loved what Sheldon said in terms of what he looked at in terms of trends with his major wealthy families. I structure everything and build a foundation, diversification, plan B, and portfolio construction. And then Andrew spoke about the different opportunities and these mega trends, diversification, and, um, and, and basically affordability being a major problem. But what he said at the end uh, to that whole thing was keep it simple with regards to making wealth and preserving wealth and have the buckets to complement each. And then Garth spoke about investing being all about logic and that you know, your investment plan doesn't actually change with your emotions. And then spoke about the six mega trends and um, we had anxious societies, infrastructure, tech and digitization, the whole millennial factor, the silver, I still don't know if it's hair, but <laughs> silver something and the kind of the mental aging perspective and then the green investing, climate change, uh, et cetera. And then finally, in terms of some of the concluding comments was that when you're diversifying, diversify across not just different uh, stocks, but also different industries. Um, Andrew had this quote from the US billionaire, William Funderbilt, any fool can make a fortune, but it's all about keeping it. So what are you looking to achieve over the long term? Building a team and don't take risk. You know, you know, make sure you can get into good value, you know, good quality assets without taking risk and getting reliable reward. And then finally, you know, God spoke about the fundamentals and how the fundamentals don't change. And really, one of the two things I took away there, God, that I loved was make sure that you're reading books. You'll get the best info from books. And also write down your mantras. I've heard that a lot. And often people don't do that. It's kind of their rules. That's why Ray Dalio calls it his principles, so that he doesn't break his, his principles. And then in conclusion, Sheldon spoke about some of the mega trends again and some of the risk uh, components that, that you know, people will be looking at. And finally finished, and I like what you said, Sheldon, around you know, some of those big trends that will be happening over the next 10 years. And whether we like it or not, you know, they're going to be happening. So we might as well get used to them and start to understand them. So gentlemen and Lee, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. I think we basically uh, covered all the questions in terms of where we're at. We've covered the, the survey. And if anyone in terms of the panelists has any ideas around how you would want to cover diversification, then, you know, please reach out to Lee and I and um, you know, let people know about it. If you want to share this with your friends from a recording perspective, we will share the recording. But Lee, without further ado, I hand back to you. Thank you very much, Scott, and to our panelists. Thank you for making yourself available to our community tonight. Really valuable insights that were shared and we value your time. So thank you very much. I just want to give a shout out to one of our members, our wealth partner that is online. It is Manu. Um, Manu, thank you for spending your birthday with us. It is your birthday. You did ask us um, all on the internal groups to do something kind on your behalf. So I hope that your wishes were met, but happy birthday from everyone at the Global Wealth Group. Um, and thank you for spending your birthday with us. Um, and then just to circle back to right at the beginning when I told you that we had our um, partnership with B1G1, um, for tonight's webinar, um, we will be donating for, uh, 54 days of education, nine days of clean water, and we'll be planting 10 trees on your behalf. So thank you to everyone who did participate and remember to put the E, W, or T behind their comments. We really do appreciate it. And I know that the team at uh, B1G1 and the recipients of that will really appreciate it. 
So thank you everybody uh, for attending tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will be sending out the recording as Scott said, so please share to those who you feel could add value. And uh, look out for our invitation to our upcoming uh, webinar on the 1st of June with Mark around creating your diversified portfolio. So wherever you are, be blessed, take care and hope to see you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.